Hey, 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 everybody. Great, great, great to see all y'all out there in Son of Slam land. Uh, hey. uh, we got a great one for you today. Yes, I've been looking forward to this so much. I decided to do it a day early. I just couldn't wait for this one. <clears throat> and we have our international audience. We got the Lizard Kings from Norway. We everyone's in the chat today the gang is all here i want to say a special hello to a new guy in the chat although an old uh, i guess an old listener but someone who uh, his name is new to me within the last couple of months uh from facebook a gentleman by the name of derek larson derek welcome 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 uh great to have you here so um yeah i mean listen <laughs> Boy, did I prepare you guys a slideshow today. Uh, we, 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 we're going to, we're going to, we have a great time today. We're going to, we're going to cover, well, what are we doing today? Well, listen, I don't have any flowery intros and I don't have any, any guests to, to, to bring on. So we might as well just get right into it. Mo Terry, the greatest hits of a true crime criminal. Yes, I am being bold, and I'm calling him a true crime criminal. Why? Well, because this guy shat all over the truth and made us all eat that shit sandwich. Some people are still eating the shit sandwich. <laughs> it's hilarious to actually watch because um, when you have this much evidence, and not, today we're only going through 10. I, th this could be a series. In fact, if, if you guys like this, maybe I will make this into a, into a short series. But I had to pick ten, so uh, we we're gonna we're gonna count those down today. So let's just get started, shall we? Let me just grab a little bit of water, if you don't mind, while you all get situated. All right, I'm really looking forward to this one. So Mo Terry, the greatest hits of a true crime criminal, of course. This is. Uh, our protagonist today, Mo Terry, here on a, uh, on a in an area very familiar to, to you guys. We have uh, Berkowitz's apartment building up here, of course. He's right behind the car house in an area that you all know as the uh, Croton Aqueduct. And, of course, this is Mo Terry in about 1984, 85. I'm not quite sure when this was. I think 84. He had a series of promo photographs taken. I actually have the originals. I was uh, given to them. Um. I was given them by uh, one of Maury Terry's uh, researchers. And so I, I, I superimposed my image over here, just looking down on this guy, right? This guy's the past, we're the present, and we're the future. Notice I say we, because it ain't about me. <laughs> All right. So, of course, before we begin uh, any discussion of Mo Terry and what a f liar manipulator, bullier, and abuser he was. Of course, we have to get the uh, the man of the hour's opinion of him. Uh, and who was that? Well, of course, how did, how did Disco Dave feel about old Mo? <laughs> right? Because this is the guy that all the morons of the world are uh, hanging their hat on. This guy, David Berkowitz, right? Freaking uh, shoot, lone shooter of, of, uh, of six people, wounding, uh, uh, killing six, wounding seven. I mean, all these shootings that he did by himself. And then, of course, he trolled he trolled uh, Maury Terry having a great time doing it. And of course, let's uh, yeah, book club. That's right. He was rocking a members only jacket. But you know what? Listen, hindsight's 2020. We can't we can't diss the members only jacket because, yo, <clears throat> not for nothing. But this thing was in style back then. So Maury was actually, you know, it was actually a pretty styling, dude. Give me a second here. My uh, my uh, phone's ringing. Let me just shut it off for a second. Sorry about that. All right. So, uh, you know, it's not as cool as my Michael Jackson. I had a, a replica Michael Jackson red jacket, you know, with the with the chains on it and the zippers everywhere. I remember I had one of those back in those years. So anyway, all right. So how did Disco Dave feel about old Mo? Well, you and I all already know, but of course, this episode of Mo, Mo Terry's Greatest Hits is for those of those people who might not want to go back to my old archive and see some of my takedowns. 
But but uh, Disco Dave had, well, definite opinions on Mo Terry and his cult theory. Well, the first one, of course, is of co this letter to D Channel, which is a little bit too hard to read. Um, I had to like really go in like this and put it through clarifiers and all this stuff. Anyway, it's much easier for me to read it here. And I and I copied it note for uh, letter by letter by letter. Ho hold on one second. Someone's trying to get a hold of me. It's really annoying. I, let me just shut this down. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. So I wrote Ma Maury Terry a couple letters, but I've called it quits with him because he's a pest. In one letter, he asked about 30 questions. These weren't yes or no questions either. Goodness, he wanted a whole book. So I'm just going to ignore him because it's gotten out of hand. And I didn't answer his questions either. Pienshak still writes from time to time. And he asked when I will let him up here. He wants to visit because of this new investigation. My answer for the last three months was no. So you see, this whole thing was a big pile of confusion anyhow. It was also needless and superfluous. Well, we fought each other over nothing, really. In the end, I just got so mad that I dropped Terry and Pienchak both. Goodbye, fellas. D, I had a hunch that the two books were from you, since nothing written inside them and since Terry didn't mention you ever, while well, I just assumed that it was a coincidence. Thanks for them. Yes, you were obviously being used as a stepping stone by these two non-Christian fools. I have to last laugh because they were men most ignorant. No, some investigators these guys would have been. I'm sure they would have been dead by now if they went any further. They probably would have froze to death in North Dakota. They're so stupid. Why, they probably couldn't tell the difference between a demon and Richard Nixon. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> So I don't know how the morons of the world, M-A-U-R-O-N-S, not morons, morons, M-A-U-R-O-N-S, Maury fans. I don't know how you like deal with this kind of stuff because like, what do you like? Do you have to put your head in even deeper up your asses <laughs> to ignore this? Because this exists. This is like actually real. The Berkowitz wrote this. All right. Here's his, here's his signature, David, right? Here's his, uh, everything, everything looks legit. This is totally him. How? How does the moron live with this? I don't understand. Like, what what cognitive different dissonance do you need in order to still believe that he was truthful to Maury, yet reading this and realizing that he thought Maury was? <laughs> Let's see. What did he what did he call Maury in this? He called him stupid, <laughs> a non Christian fool, uh, so dumb he would have froze to death. I mean, these are not the words of a ringing endorsement. And of course, he didn't have a ringing endorsement for Maury because Berkowitz thought that the cult theory was complete bullshit, as we read here. And again, in something that actually exists in the real world. Now, as for this cult, I'm aware of many stories about an accomplice. Morons, take heed. But this isn't true. Okay? So we're not going to read any of the rest of this because it's it doesn't have anything that's just about his lawyer and the return and client privilege. Now, he, here's the money shot. As far as I know, it is just like you said. The investigation in Westchester didn't lead anywhere. I assume that it has been discontinued and it probably started because of a series of unrelated coincidences and erroneous information. So morons, how do you feel about this? Here, here Berkowitz is saying the cult story, it's not true. He didn't have an accomplice. Uh, it was started because of unrelated coincidences and erroneous information. Yes, the unrelated coincidences, um, which we've gone over a million times in this. The fact that he didn't know John Carr, but, you know, like all of these weird. Actually, there weren't too many coincidences when you really stop and think about it because there was no cult. There was no actual real story of a cult. But here, here is Berkowitz himself telling whoever he's writing here. I think this is either to Abrahamson or to D Channel. I think it's to Abrahamson. He's basically saying straight up, he's like, yo, Schmendrix out there of the world. There was no cult. This is this is not true. It, it didn't, it never existed. All right. So um, I choose to believe this Berkowitz. If you don't want to, hey, um, listen, you could still think that there's a cult. I, don't let me stop you. 
I hear Santa Claus is uh, also lives at the North Pole with some elves. And I hear the Easter Bunny is on some island somewhere. And last night, the Tooth Fairy came and, and took uh, someone's tooth away. I, I hear that's true as well. <sighs> All right. So let's carry it on. So when the, the ultimate evil first came out, of course, many were convinced it was the truth, the absolute truth. We were everyone here who's with me, uh, who has who has been with me from the beginning, who's a Maury fan. You've probably gone through the same thing. Like me, you were a Maury fan. And as and as um, time went on, you realized that you were bullshitted too. And because you have self-respect and, and, a, and a modicum of brain uh, of intelligence, you realized that, that you were lied to, you didn't like it, and you changed your mind because the new evidence came in. See, a lot of, it's, it's weird. My critics go, man, he, he started, his handlers, this is, this is what they say, Manny's handlers set it all up. They realized the Netflix video was coming out and that was going to, uh, uh, actually, I don't even know what they say. They realized the Netflix video was going to come out. And so therefore they put Manny's handlers, put him out to prop up the cult theory and then tear it down. I mean, that's actually what these guys say to each other. They think I have handlers. <laughs> they think that I'm like a member of some satanic cult. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. So a lot of people thought that this was the truth and I was there and probably you were too. And of course, people eventually over time, right? As time went on with the ultimate evil, people eventually settled into thinking that, you know, perhaps Maury went too far with the nationwide conspiracy thing, but that his work on the shootings was impeccable. Right. And after a while, that's what we would all tell each other. It was like, yo, yeah, Maury went a little off the deep end with that whole process stuff, but the shooting information was perfect. You know, even in Carl Denaro's book, we have this here, right? This is from Carl Denaro's Son of Sam and Me. Still, he did some amazing work. Some of the ultimate evil may have been exaggerated, but he should have won an award for the first three quarters of the book. Everything in that section is backed up with facts, although in my opinion, he should have ended it 150 pages sooner. He legitimately proved that Berkowitz couldn't have done all the shootings. It was totally solid. Well, Carl, <laughs> hate to say it, my man, but <laughs> you were used like a cheap dime store pack animal by a drunkard by the name of Maury Terry. Um, he thought nothing of you. He thought you were a piece of shit to be used to give his sham investigation some, some credibility. Wake up, man. Get some self-respect. So, um, so this is kind of like, was, it was kind of like the thought of many of us going into, you know, 2021 around the time that Netflix came out that, you know, the, the process stuff was a little overblown, but that the shooting information was completely legit. Well, as John Catalano and I have proven time and time again by analyzing these uh, shootings, some, several sh uh, some of the shootings, Lomino de Masi, Moskowitz right now, we're knee deep into uh, actually neck deep in, into the Freund case. We're coming out with some amazing stuff soon. We now though know that his work even on the shootings was garbage. OK, he he totally manipulated the evidence. He juiced it. He 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 literally made shit up when he needed to. He, he changed times. He 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 did all sorts of manipulation with the with the actual real police evidence that that's unconscionable. And we're going to see some of that today. So, of course, this bespeaks to the larger problem with his life's work. Right. And his life's work is his work on the Son of Sam case, the Son of Sam cult case which was non-existent. So his life work was, was, was shit. It was garbage. So his life's work basically boils down to this lying, manipulation, bullying, and abuse. So of course, um, quite frankly, <clears throat> pretty much all of the ultimate evil can be discarded as shit stained garbage. I mean, let's just face it. Vinny and Danny, uh, <clears throat> never existed. The letter from the uh, person in Yonkers congratulating him for the uh, telling him about Andrew Dupay. He wrote to himself. Um, pretty much all of his work on the shootings was crap. The the process stuff was garbage. Manson too. In fact, we we could do a, a, a 
we should do try to do a show on what he got right. <laughs> that would be a very short show. So all of the all of the ultimate evil, it's just shit stained garbage. Maury's life's work is shit stained garbage. Okay. I hope that one day when I'm dead, that somebody doesn't say that about me. Um, but I'm not sitting here lying to you and manipulating you and bullying you and abusing you, right? I'm actually treating with you with respect because I actually do respect my audience. I don't take you for granted. I don't, I don't try to play you for suckers like, like, um, like, uh, Maury Terry did. All right. So Maury's lying and manipulation is now laid bare for the world to see. If you want, if you want proof of that, well, I have over 150 videos waiting for you to see. Okay. All of which are about how he lied to us. So we also know now now know how he treated his so-called quote friends and quote fellow researchers. And so we're going to take a look at that as well. So of course before we start let's take another passage passage from Carl's book because it's it's really instructive to see to read Carl's book because well you know Car Carl still carries water for this drunkard. Um, you know, losing every shred of respect and credibility that he could possibly have amongst real son of Sam researchers. He's been he's been relegated to the to the to the clown squad. OK, and he and he could have been with all of us. He could have been with the cool kids. He could have been with the most popular son of Sam's series around. He could have been with those who were actually making an impact in this case, us. OK, but instead he chose another way. Once he got to the California part of the book, there was a lot of information that he put out there with very little evidence. Things to do with the Zodiac Killer and his connection with Manson. Much of it seemed like a cheap plug to gain interest in the book. No one buys into that part of the book. Oh yeah, Carl? <laughs> because of that, he opened up the doors for everyone to call him a conspiracy theorist and mock him. As a person, Maury was a lot like his book, The Ultimate Evil. 95% of him was brilliant and true, but the rest of him was just a little bit larger than life. Now, first of all, this is a very nice way, a little bit larger than life. The rest of him was just a little bit larger than life. That's a nice way of saying that he was just a stone cold liar. I mean, I mean let's just face it. He was larger than life. Oh, he was larger than life. He was like his book. 95% honest and true, 5% larger than life. No, he was a liar. I mean, let's just say what it is, Carl. He, he, the guy lied. He was a bullshit artist par, par excellence. I mean, the guy had no equal when it came to, when it came to just the straight up boldness of his, of his lying. And also, I'm going to amend one of your other statements in here. 95% of the book and him was not brilliant and true. I would say that 95% of him and the book was larger than life. And maybe 5% was, I wouldn't call him brilliant. I mean, I don't, I don't know where you're getting this crap from. So anyway, so now we're up to, and we are at the point where we can now start counting down. Moe's greatest hits. Sorry, I'm just reading some of the comments. Ralph, dude, what does Ralph dude say? Hard for Carl to accept that things went so wrong that he was deceived in such an intimate and personal way by some someone who was friend. I, I mean, I would hope that that's the case, but I think Carl actually still actually still believes. He's on record as saying that he believes Maury Terry still. It's just absolutely, absolutely insane. All right. So Moe's greatest hits counted down from 10 to 1. 10, the warning to police letter. Now, of course, some of you guys who have been with me this whole time, this is old news to you. But again, I'm, 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 a lot of new people are watching and, and a lot of people have not seen my old stuff. So I, this is an important one. So the warning to police letter was used by Maury Terry right, almost right at the beginning of, his, of the book. He used this to, to, quote, prove that there was a satanic cult but um, behind the, the shootings. And not only that, but that Berkowitz wrote a letter to authorities warning about this cult. So in a suburban Yonkers apartment building high above the Hudson River, a young man named David Berkowitz used the anniversary date for his own purposes. He knew what was in the wind and he knew how it could end for him. He wasn't sure there'd be another opportunity, so he didn't pr dare procrastinate. His July 29th celebration would be poignant. Little did he know or think that the letter would be suppressed by authorities. Nearly four years would elapse before it came into my hands. 
This is a warning to all police agencies in the tri-state area. For your information, a satanic cult, devil worshippers and practitioners of witchcraft, that has been established for quite some time has been instructed by their high command, Satan, to begin to systematically kill and slaughter young girls or people of good health and clean blood. They plan to kill at least 100 young women and men, but mostly women, as part of a satanic ritual which involves the shedding of the victim's innocent blood. Warning, the streets shall be run with blood. I, David Berkowitz, have been chosen, chosen since birth to be one of the executioners for the cult. He who hath eyes, let him see the dead victims. He who hath ears, let him listen to what I say. July 29th came and passed without incident. So, of course, Maury, this is a scary letter, right? When I read this in The Ultimate Evil, that was it. That's all the proof I needed as a moron. I was convinced. He was talking about the process here. They were, they were established for quite some time. They've been instructed by their high command to kill. The whole point of Son of Sam was to create havoc and terror. This works perfectly well. This is part of Maury's manipulation because here's the original letter and he left half of it out. Okay, this is a warning to all police agencies in the tri-state area for your information, a satanic cult. So it's all the same here, right? They plan to kill at least 100 Yemen and men, men, the victims have chosen. So he left out this part right here in their ritual. The victims are chosen at random and then blood is spilled. At this time, demons in the spirit cannot be seen by humans. Gather around the wounded and slain victim like a flock of vultures. Right. So here he goes, I receive no reward for my services. My services are performed in honor of my master, high priest, General Cosmo, Jack Cassara. So here's the guy who he was saying was like the high command. Right. He's performing the services of honor of this guy, not the process, his old landlord in, in New Rochelle. Right. And here's the two more pages warning at this time. There are people, they appear to be people, but they are not. I mean, how would you have felt if Mori had put this whole letter in the ultimate evil? He's talking about here, it's going to be fun to die. I just can't wait to taste my own blood. I want the cops to kill me and so on and so forth. Again, echoes of the Breslin letter right here. Kill me with smoking 38s, right? So again, this is a classic example of Maury Terry manipulating and juicing information to steer our minds towards a desired outcome, which he was manipulating the whole time. Number nine, the dog ear. So because Maury actually had no real world evidence um, to to make his story make any narrative sense, he actually had to invent he actually had to invent it. When he needed to invent it out of whole cloth, he invented it out of whole cloth. And our, our number three, two, and one will deal with that. But whenever he needed to, he just simply um, manipulated it. So he sometimes he would take truthful events and, and try to connect them in such a way that would steer you, would manipulate your mind into thinking a certain way. So there was a passage in The Ultimate Evil about the dog ear. Okay, let's just read it. Leslie Shago provided an important link between New York and Minot rituals when she produced a receipt which showed that she brought the ear of a German shepherd to a taxidermist for mounting on August 9th, 1977, the day before Berkowitz's arrest. I didn't know what it meant, she said. Bobby Dukes, a friend of John Carr's, asked me to do it for him. In the Pine Street neighborhood, a German shepherd was later found with an ear sliced off. So notice here he's, he does a, a lot in this paragraph. First of all, he says it's an important link. He's saying that there's a link now. He is linking New York and Minot with the dog ear. Okay. He says the dog ear was mounted on August 9th, the day before Berkowitz's arrest. So he's connecting it to Berkowitz's arrest. Your mind has to fill in the blanks, right? But he he's, he's bringing you three quarters of the way there. And then he says that Bobby Dukes... A friend of John Carr's asked to do it for him. So he connected it to John Carr because it was a friend of John Carr who asked to do it. And then he goes even further and explicitly says a German shepherd was later found with an ear sliced off in the Pine Street neighborhood. So this is clearly him steering you to think that the dog ear in Minot, North Dakota, 
was sliced off in Yonkers after a satanic ritual right before Berkowitz's arrest, probably as some ritual to his arrest in these people's minds. They have rituals for everything. Everything gets a ritual. And um, and then uh, they sliced it off and then they bring it to, to Minot, North Dakota, and they and, and John Carr gives it to Bobby Dukes. OK, so that's the implication here. I, I mean, right. Moet. Exactly. He was circle jerk in the pipe band as usual. I mean, give me a break here. So it's like it's like I, I don't see any other way to read this. If anyone else wants to read this passage in a certain in, in any other way, please uh, get in touch with me. Let's have a discussion about this. But look at what I found in the office of the Queens District Attorney from Michael Armenti, who was investigating this interview with Leslie Schwago. OK. Leslie Bauman Schwago. Married to a member of the Air Force and living at the Minot Air Force Base, she was interviewed as a result of having a dog's ear mounted at Henson's Taxidermist in Glenburn, North Dakota. Leslie stated that in August of 1977, while at the apartment of Bobby Bouquet and sitting in the kitchen, she mentioned to Bobby Bouquet that her father did some taxidermy work on animals that he killed. Upon learning such, Bobby opened the freezer door, took out a dog's ear, and asked her to have it mounted by her father. He said this was the ear of a sentry dog at the base that he had become affectionate towards, but the dog had gone mad and had to be put to sleep. He asked the pathologist performing the autopsy to sever its ear and return it to him. All right, so we don't need to, re re we don't have to read the rest of this. So here's the truth, guys. It's like so benign and so banal. It, it, it beggars belief. I figured I'd throw as many bees in there as I could from Bobby Bouquet, right? So he so Maury got the date right, August of 77. Everything else he literally got wrong. He actually made up a whole narrative that did not exist in the real world. The truth was that this guy, Bobby, in August already had the dog's ear in his freezer. He would have had to have had it because it said he took it out of the freezer. So it wasn't the dog ear that he said Maury said it was, right? In the Pine Street neighborhood, a German separate was later found with an ear sliced off. So this is just another example of manipulation, abuse, lying. It's ridiculous. James Can, number eight. This is a good one. I like this one. This is this one's fun. Give me a sec here. By the way, my my station was just monetized. I finally got YouTube monetization. I haven't set it up yet. Maybe finally I'll be able to afford a new mic stand. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is crazy. Um, I haven't figured out how I'm going to do that yet. Anyway, because uh, I hate ads on, on on videos, maybe I'll just set it up for Super Chat only. I'm not quite sure because it wouldn't hurt. and It would be great to make a couple bucks doing this again. All right. So Jimmy can, James can. All right. So Maury Terry one of the biggest things that he held over the head of his minions, his followers, was he knew the identity of the 22 disciples of hell. He knew who was in the who was in the cult. And it was those names, those precious names that every researcher and son of Sam wanted. Right. And which he never gave us. He gave us pseudonyms. He gave us false names and all sorts of stuff like that. So at the end of the ep of the ultimate evil, the epilogue in 97 repeated again in 2020, 2021, when the book came out again, he talks about um, he has like a little cast of characters at the end. And, and, and in it, well, let's just read what he writes about this character named James Can. J.D. Can. A Yonk. Oh, sorry. A Yonkers residence who lived in Berkowitz's apartment building in 1977. Can committed suicide in late 1998. A witness told police that Can occasionally drove the yellow Volkswagen. According to the witness, after Berkowitz's arrest, Can told co workers he needed to obtain a gun because people were after him. It's going to be them or me, the witness quoted Can as saying. Berkowitz remarked, Can belonged to the group, but he wasn't at any of the 44 shootings. <sighs> all right. So first of all, all right. So let's see. Maury said that he lived in Berkowitz's apartment building. Okay. He drove the yellow Volkswagen. All right. And that he told Berkowitz that people were after him. So the, the Im implication here was that he was like best friends with Berkowitz enough to like, um, 
Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Can told co-workers that. All right. Sorry. That's that's my mistake. Uh, but that he belonged to the group. So he was in the cult. Here, Here's Maury saying J.D. Can, spelled C-A-N-N, was in the cult. And he lived in Berkowitz's apartment building. Now, let's see how, let's see by the time this, so now this is the ultimate evil. Let's see how this morphs by the time it gets to Carl DeNaro's book. Well, now he's the actor, Jimmy Kahn from The Godfather. <laughs> I mean, give me, I mean, let's just, just bathe in that for a second. It's so, it's so beautiful. <laughs> Carl not only slander, I mean, there's a dead guy, right? But he not only puts the dead guy, never had anything to do with this, into the 22 Disciples of Hell, he, he names him after the freaking, um, he names him after the famous actor. He misspells the name and he doesn't even have like, proper editing in his book to figure that out allegedly one of the 22 disciples of hell but he wasn't at any of the son of sam attack he lived in the apartment building at 35 pine street yonkers new york the same building as berkowitz berkowitz has stated in interviews that they were friends and accomplices can was one of several people who helped clear out and deface berkowitz's apartment days before his arrest to make it look like a madman lived there can committed suicide right after the Yonkers police department questioned him about the son of Sam case when the case was reopened in the mid 1990s. Well, did they actually question him? Uh, they had opened it up in the mid 1990s. It says here that he committed suicide in 1998. That's a couple of years after they reopened it. So I don't know, Carl, I think you need to get your facts straight. But anyway, who was this guy, Jimmy can? Well, there's a whole Yonkers police report on this guy. OK. And we don't need to read the whole thing, but this is about this guy, Jimmy Can, who, by the way, I don't know. I understand how they got his last name is Can, because there's no nowhere does it say his 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 uh, his. His. Oh, God. Oh, man. I, you know what? I put in stupidly. I put in the same two pages. Oh, man. Give me a second here. Let me see if I can find the actual proper one because normally i don't make these mistakes as you know but i made it here give me a second um okay well i don't have it handy but anyway if you go to the yonkers the yonkers um police reports it's in there and basically the punchline is jimmy can his mother lived in berkowitz's building OK, he didn't live there. Secondly, he would run into Berkowitz every now and then, but he wasn't he wasn't friends with him. He, he, he would call him Berkey. But let me tell you something about Yonkers and nicknames. Everyone in who you, who you go up to Yonkers in the 90s, 80s, 70s, even into the 2000s. If you had a name, Jim, you became Jimmy. Bob becomes Bobby. Um, tone. Uh, uh, um, you know, everybody's name ends up with a Y at the end of it or an EY. So Berkowitz became Berkey. It's not that big a deal for someone to just call someone Berkey, even if he's not like great friends with him. So anyway, that is the the point of that. Um, I don't want to go. I see Verity. I see what you're saying. I don't want to go look for it <clears throat> again. I'm not trying to trying to be coy. I just made the mistake in putting put the same two pages. And this is page two. It's on page one. But anyway, um, there's no evidence in here whatsoever that this guy had anything whatsoever to do with uh, Berkowitz. He said he said that um, he wanted to purchase a firearm type weapon, but would give no explanation. OK, so everything more he said, I don't even know where he's getting this stuff from because it's not in this police report. In fact, the, the, it's the opposite. Everything that's in this police report is basically the opposite of what Maury said. Can did not live in the building. His mother lived in the building. He would occasionally visit her. Him driving a VW means nothing because there was no VW in Brooklyn uh, that, that mattered or meant anything. So anyway, this one didn't come off as good as I wanted it. But there it is. Jimmy can. Number seven, Maury is not a good friend. Maury is just, well, a horrible friend. I mean, we just got to face facts. That's just the long and short of it. The guy sucked as a friend. He didn't know how to, he didn't know how to like treat people. So let's take some passages out of Carl DeNaro's book because 
I mean, Carl DeNaro gets the gets the credit for being the first person to put me on the stink eye on Maury. I mean, you know, it's funny. Everyone gets angry at me for going against Maury. Yo, go talk to your boy, Carl, because he was the one that wrote this book, right? Where we have passages like this. At his worst, Maury was secretive, controlling and dominating. The Facebook group gave him full reign to exercise those traits. Maury fed Charles info and messages that he wanted posted much of which was hard for most of the group members to figure out. Uh, that sounds like a terrible person to me. <clears throat> One of the things he teased the Facebook group with when it came to fresh information was the true identity of the cult leader, also known as Mr. Real Estate. Maury had given me his identity back in 2006. Maury had told me the identity of Mr. Real Estate. After Maury gave me the name of Mr. Real Estate, I then spent nine years trying to connect the dots and prove without a shadow of a doubt his involvement in the murders. As hard as I tried, I never had been able to quite get there. Yeah, you know why, Carl? Because your boy Maury was feeding you shit. That's why. And probably laughing at you in the process because he knew it was all complete crap. I mean, give me a, I mean this is absolutely ridiculous. I mean... Uh, that's one thing I don't do as a researcher. One thing I make sure to do is I come up here, I show you all of my sources, I tell you exactly where to find them. When I make a mistake like I just did with putting two of the same pieces of thing in, I actually kick myself in the ass and tell you where to go find the right thing and to go fact check me. Please go do that because I want, I want to uh, make sure that I'm being kept honest here and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, Maury Terry is like giving... Carl DeNaro, a poor victim of David Berkowitz, shot with um, in an early shooting when Berkowitz wasn't putting his both hands on his gun. So, so the sh shots were wild, which was why um, they thought a woman shot shot it. Um, Maury knew it the whole time, most likely, and he was feeding DeNaro bullshit. He just wanted DeNaro around so so he could say to to his critics, "Well, a victim believes me, right?" Meanwhile, Denaro probably paid all the bar tab bills. <sighs> this was the dark side of Maury's personality. He could be controlling, secretive, and demanding. And he definitely got a kick out of playing games, just like the supposed son of Sam did. Maury would often give me a piece of information that was totally different than what he would give to someone else. As much as it seemed that Maury wanted to know the whole truth about the Son of Sam murders, he was equally concerned with being in control of everything and being the only person that understood the whole picture. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't the only per He was the only person who understood how much he was bullshitting all you idiots. What did John Catalano have to say here? That wacko John Mitchell accused the guy who lived across the street from Berkowitz of being Corman Johnson, the guy who was a school teacher who was in Maury's Facebook group, laughed my ass off. Yeah. No one ever accused John Mitchell of being the sharpest tack in the shed, the the, the sharpest tool, the <laughs> having a having a very uh first class brain. He kind of reminds me of the dude uh Little Jack, I think, in Tropic Thunder, uh the adventures of Little Jack. Uh, I, I uh, got a good brain. All right. Riddlin the researchers, number six. As we count down Mo Terry's greatest hits, and let me tell you something. I could have gone on for 40, 50, 60, 70 greatest hits. It was actually hard for me to edit this down. Riddlin the researchers. Well, as you all know, and those who have worked with me know that I'm all about full disclosure, sharing everything, making sure that everybody is getting credit for their work, making sure that everyone is happy, and so on and so forth. I have never once tried to tra take credit for anything that wasn't mine. I've always given my researchers and the people who work with me all, all the credit that they are due. Maury, on the other hand, loved to, uh, well, fool people and, and write riddles to people and, and have the people who were like taking this seriously, his cult thesis seriously, he would ride them through hoops. So let's take a, a, a look at some examples of him riddling the researchers. So again, from, from Carl DeNaro's book, 
Much like the son of Sam supposedly loved teaching, teasing Breslin and the police, Maury loved teasing the group. He would often put up clues that were supposed to lead members to a name of someone involved with the attacks or to who or to who an anonymous photo was of, but most of them were so obscure they were impossible to figure out. If people didn't guess enough at what the answer may be or act like they were interested, Maury would get very angry and go off on a rant about people not caring enough about the group. Maury would get so upset he would threaten to withhold info from them in the future. My daughter was a member of the group, and Maury would even give me a hard time about her not hitting the like button enough. An example of an easy riddle that he put. Well, first of all, let's deal with this. So Maury would get angry if people didn't care enough about his group. He would get upset. He would withhold information. I mean, what the hell was wrong with this guy? An example of an easy riddle that he posted was a beetle once. Quaker, Beast of Burden, Gimme Shelter, which came out to Best Friends Animal Sanctuary. Best Friends Animal Sanctuary is an offshoot of the Process Church of Final Judgment. These riddles were just another way to keep the group on their toes as well as to mess with their minds. Hannah, you are so correct. The real Son of, Son, Son of Sam cult is run by the morons. But And so let's deal with this, right? So these riddles were just another way to keep the group on their toes as well as to mess with their minds. Well, first of all, it's not a way to keep them on their toes, okay, Carl? Mess with their minds, I will agree with. But it's not a, to keep them on their toes because they didn't learn anything from this crap, right? Here's another example. A Ray Charles hit song, sort of, regarding a devilish plot. Uh, White Christmas Sisters, Undermeyer Park? Yes, it was. Uh, a quote from a space alien. What happened when the outlaw shot at Annie Oakley? There you go. Easy right. This time, the fantastic prize will be a four-day, one-way cruise from New York on the steamer Juicy Lucy. I mean, what the hell is this guy talking about? Right? Mr. Real Estate's funeral. So here he is talking about a guy who never existed, Mr. Real Estate, making his his supporters jump through hoops in order to, to get the in order to get the identity of someone who never actually existed, Mr. Real Estate. Okay. I mean, can you imagine this? Can you imagine me doing this to you guys? Okay. I remember like when we we when we were actually the first a, a, a group to come out with a lot of these letters before they were put out into the Queen's DA. We had a lot of this stuff before Queen's DA came out. I put it all out there for the world to see. I made big events out of it. It was live streams. I invited people in. I shared them with everybody. Everybody got a copy. It was like the biggest deal for all of us. And all of us had a great time reading these and learning. I never made anybody run through a riddle or a, a perfect example. Um, Al Romano, the guy who showed me the cross on the tree, he used to be one of uh, Maury's researchers and he ended up hating Maury's guts. Okay. He hated Maury Terry. This guy gets in touch with me, uh, November, 2021 shows me the cross on the tree. And as we're going to find it, he actually didn't, he knew the vicinity of where it was. Uh, he didn't know exactly what it, where it was. I was the one that actually found it on the tree. But the point is that he said that Maury knew where it was. And he told Al back in, I don't know, the nineties or early two thousands, you see, he said, go 1500 feet North of the gatehouse. And it's there. The it's actually 1500 feet South of the gatehouse. So he literally sent a guy in the opposite, polar opposite direction in order to find something. And then and then he was fooling this guy. And this was a guy who like really was troubled guy. He wanted to know the truth about Son of Sam. He had some personal issues uh, regarding regarding um, some things on Lake Avenue, which I'm not going to get into. Uh, and he was like really, really emotionally invested in this and he, and and and. I mean, he was beside himself how much he just loathed Maury Terry. So one of the reasons why, of course, is because he would pull bullshit like this. Okay. Here is a post that Maury put up in theory to give people clues as to who Mr. Real Estate was. Even with knowing his names, the clues don't seem to match up to Donovan. That's James Donovan of Purchase, New York, Rye, New York, who's supposedly Mr. Real Estate. 
Below is the actual post from the Facebook group. What is this? Well, for one thing, it's a new quiz. This one will even be called, what is this? So what is it and why does it matter? Or does it? Clues? Sure. Connected to the overall SOS investigation? Not exactly Polaroid, but kind of. An Atlanta neighborhood, a Boston team, Texas and Wyoming qualify. As you can see, this was about as clear as mud. Maury wasn't trying to give out information. He was trying to conceal it unless someone proved themselves worthy. This is the kind of thing Maury was always doing. Instead of just telling people something, he would make up some long convoluted riddle to try and make them guess it. Oddly enough, the only person I can think of that did such things was the writer of the Son of Sam letters. Now, wouldn't that be some shit, right? If it turned out at the end of the day that Maury Terry and David Berkowitz were the... <laughs> Or actually the cult and that Maury Terry wrote the son of Sam letters and that and that the reason why they were so taunting and filled with riddles and <laughs> was because Maury Terry wrote them. <clears throat> Morons don't get any ideas here. All right. <clears throat> Give me a second. So this is unconscionable behavior. This is disgusting behavior. And 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 what's even more disgusting is that his sycophantic idiotic followers weren't like yo f you fat ass G screw you up in your parents attic G drinking yourself to death who why are you wasting my time my time is precious i'm a i'm a valuable human being with agency and self-respect why are you treating me this way why are you making me run through riddles and hoops just give us the damn name so we can investigate we're here to help you maury and you're here and you're here giving us riddles. Of course, none of them said that, right? They were all like, oh, Maury, <laughs> you're so honest. Maury, uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, may I have another? That's basically what it boils down to with these people of the world. All right. So moving right along. We have here, of course, a little insight into why Maury Terry was like this. And this, of course, was uh, an early email written to me very early in the, uh, in the um, video series. And I'll just read it to you. It reg it's regarding a guy who grew up with Maury Terry. I hope you don't mind if I send an occasional email like this one. Whenever thoughts pop into my head, I really meant to... <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just going to have to read it to you, even if you can't read it on the screen. I can't. I just can't. Zooming in sucks. I really meant to relay some thoughts on Mo Terry as I knew him, and if you allow me, I'll continue on. Mo was a few years my senior. It was during this recess time when myself and my friends would have rather unfriendly contacts with Mo and his friends. We would play games of tag and ringolivio, modified to use only one jail, with one team being the cops and the other being the crooks, using other students as barriers. As we played, we dashed in and around groups of students to avoid being tagged or captured. Although I and a couple of my friends were small statured, we were fast and nimble as jackrabbits. Apparently, this pissed off Mo and his bunch off so that they would constantly try to trip us as we ran by. Many a knee were wrecked in the falls we all suffered. It's a good, it was a good thing that my mom could mend the tears on my uniform slacks. It was the first instances of bullying by Mo and company. Over the, over the following years, we would play baseball on the school field, which was situated behind the high school's three buildings. That field is where that monstrous round edifice to Finian's ego was built. We younger kids would be playing on that field as, as well as the one field in Lennon Park, and Mo and company would show up and try to bully us off. We lived by the first come, first served rule of street law and were willing to shed blood to that end. The school also built a seasonal skating rink on this on this on the field where we would play pickup games of hockey. We younger kids were much better than Mo and company and would challenge them to a game. I took a lot of joy from putting his fat ass on the ice more than once. He found out the hard way that the little asshole from Convent Avenue can fight and wasn't afraid of him or his pals. I still think of those days with pride. The fact that Mo has passed doesn't faze me in the least. Memories are just that. He may have changed later in life, but the last memory I have of him was th was still that of a blowhard. So here he is as a teenager th throwing nine-year-old kids onto the ground, skinning their knees. So listen, 
I bet you all of us, if you think back into your childhood, I know that I do. We we probably all have things that we're ashamed of and that we did to other people that were mean, you know. That's because we're all victims in life, you know. We're victimized and then we victimize someone else. It's it's just human nature. We, we that's just the way we are. But most of us grow out of it, right? Um I think of some things that I um, things that I was mean I was some mean to some kids in third grade that still to this day I have a like I, I feel terribly about it, right? Because we grow up and we get conscience. And maybe Maury Terry did grow up and get conscience, a conscience. And maybe he did become a better person. But I don't know. It sounds to me that the person who was throwing this nine-year-old down on his to his knees and skinning his knees when he was 16, 15 years old, a high school bully, it sounded like he just can, kept on continuing that way, that, that way. And he was doing it to his followers in the, uh, in the official Facebook group. So anyway, that one was uh, one that I, I think I might've read this before a, a year or two ago, but I'm glad that I'm getting this up there again, because it's important. This is somebody who knew Mo Terry as a child. Number five, Trudy Zeke. <laughs> so of course, <clears throat> Maury Terry didn't only lie, manipulate, bully, and abuse, uh, totally juice information in his book, completely make shit up when he needed to, treated people like absolute crap, victimized people like Carl DeNaro and, and Nasa Moskowitz into thinking that they weren't shot, that Carl wasn't shot by David Berkowitz, sending this guy on a 40 year wild goose chase, uh, making him lose all his credibility and, and respect uh, in the process. There, I did it, Ruby. <laughs> I said the process. Um, he, he victimized Nasa Moskowitz. This poor lady had her daughter. Two, one daughter was had already been dead, I think, before Stacy was killed. And then Stacy gets shot in the head and dies. But it's not only a, it does, it's not an instantaneous death. It, it happens over like two days. She could hear Stacy screaming, Mom, it hurts. Mom, it hurts so bad. This guy, Mo Terry, had this poor lady thinking that Berkowitz didn't shoot her son, her daughter, to the point where she was like sending him letters and forgiving the, the guy and saying, I'm sorry, I know you're a good guy and all this kind of stuff. That's what Maury Terry was doing in his later in his later years. OK, all on the surface of pushing a lie. I'm sorry if you guys want to live, a, li live with in moron land with denial in your head. That's great. But my name ain't Rabbi Ben Livali, Trudy Zeke. So not only did he do all that, he also made up he also made up false <laughs> num de plums and false identities for himself on the internet. It's funny people think that I do that. I have never once made a false uh, name ever, a posting or a fake name. My attitude, I learned, I learned from my my uh, my internet. Um, stance I learned from Jason Goodman. And and he taught me uh, by example, not he didn't actually teach me this, but he said, put your real name on, on the internet. Like if you're going to say something, have the balls to say it under your real name. Because otherwise you're just a, you're just an anonymous punk. OK, so like I've never once put anything under my under a fake name. I don't need to. I, I'm not scared of anyone. All right. So, so, but for some reason, Maury found fit to come up with a fake, um, <laughs> we have Trudy Zeke in the audience. <laughs> we, uh, he, he thought to come up with a fake name. He went on to Facebook with this fake name, Carl DeNaro as he's not a very smart guy. I mean, let's just, let's just face facts, but he was smart enough to realize that Trudy Zeke was fake. Maury assured me that she was cool and, and that all was fine, but I didn't buy it. Three times more, I told Maury I thought Trudy was a fake account that he was using. He denied it each time. But after his death, I found out from one of the other administrators that it was true. Maury was Trudy. Just another example of him giving one person information while withholding it from someone else. So Trudy Zeke, it was a pathetic. Maury would sit there and like confirm his own bullshit by using Trudy Zeke, right? So remember the letter to the warning to letter, which was number 10 that we saw today. Here's Trudy Zeke confirming it is real. Nahal consciously too, 
DB had left that cult warning letter hidden in his effects. The cops covered it up till Maury Terry got a hold of it and made it public. I believe it is at the end of chapter three of The Ultimate Evil. Well, first of all, Trudy is Maury. So why would he say, I believe it's at the end? He knows that it's at the end because he is Maury Terry. Why is he calling Maury Terry in the third person when Trudy Zeke is Maury Terry? And third of all, why is he still using, this was like done in like 2009, 2010, right? Why is he still using the, 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 the warning to police letter as proof of something when we all know it's bullshit? It was a letter that was part of a whole treasure trove of letters. I've just did a, did a whole four part series on those letters. It wasn't hidden away. <clears throat> it was evidence that was part of the, that was, that was just foiled. Okay. And it was part of like 50 other crazy letters. And so that's another thing that Maury did. He, he, he didn't allow us to understand context of anything. He took everything out of context and then he manipulated and juiced that information. Maury loved talking to himself. This guy just loved talking to himself. Maury, Trudy, Zeke, Maury, hello. Are you confident that you know the names of all the SOS shooters and the names of at least most of the children who are said to have actually carried out the 44 attacks at the direction of Mr. Real Estate and others, including some process leaders? Those leaders are said to have been at that planning meeting that was held at Mr. Real Estate's Central Westchester House in the spring of 76. So here's Trudy like basically asking Maury, are, are you confident in your entire sham investigation? Right? And then Maury answers Z Trudy. <laughs> yes, Trudy. Yes, I am confident. I know the names of all the SOS shooters and at least all of the scene accomplices. As far as shooters goes, the woman who wounded Carl DeNaro, the woman who murdered Virginia Voskerichian, and the male who killed Stacey Moskowitz and blinded Robert Violante remain alive and free. And so are several crime scene accomplices. The female yellow VW driver in the Brooklyn attack is just one of those. The former Yonkers cop I call Peter Shane is another. There are more. A number of leader and complicit process leader types are. I can't. I can't even finish this bullshit. I mean, this looks like ridiculous. So, so I think Hannah asked before if I think that Patrick O'Shaughnessy, who's this Peter Shane, uh, was involved in Son of Sam. My answer is um, no. I don't think that he was. He was not connected to Berkowitz in any way. They were not in the same auxiliary unit. Uh, they had mutual friends, but by the time that Shauncey came around and Berk, they they didn't have the like the, the Berkowitz's friends had already kind of abandoned Berkowitz. But um, in either case, no. The the long and the short answer is no. I think Peter uh, Patrick O'Shaughnessy was a strange and troubled man, but that he had nothing to do with Son of Sam in any way, shape, or form. Um, I can't say exactly what I saw. I mean, now I'm sounding like the lumped up morons. Um, but, uh, I was once at a, at a meeting of law enforcement when we all actually thought that, that Patrick O'Shaughnessy was involved. And there was a, a Yonkers detective, a very legendary Yonkers detective, not Mike Lorenzo. Um, this guy was still active and he was, uh, on the force when we were, when we had this meeting, he brought me a dossier, um, on Patrick O'Shaughnessy uh, that NYPD did right after. Again, it was one of those things where, where YPD and NYPD did a lot of due diligence right after the arrest. And they looked into the accomplice theory. They looked into Richie Sparaza. They, they, they looked into John Carr. And they looked into Patrick O'Shaughnessy. It just never really got publicized. They tested his gun. They did everything. There was zero ballistic evidence. There was no evidence whatsoever. Um, you're going to have to take my word for that, unfortunately. You have to believe it or not. I did see this. This this um, dossier was also shown to me in the presence of Jim Fay, John Renciari, John Comparetto. So they were all uh, there when I saw it as well. So um, anyway, so no, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, I don't think had any nothing whatsoever. So Trudy. You had great discussions with Maury. I'm sure you did. Like, I love talking to myself sometimes. Like, like, I, like sometimes I'll have conversations in my own head. Um, but I won't ever make those public. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So Trudy Zeke. All right. So we're, we're, so thanks Maury. So now Trudy answers, right? Sorry. 
So, so Trudy asks, asks a question, Maury answers, and then Trudy answers back. Thanks, Maury. It's good to know you believe you have all the shooters identified. I think many of us suspect who that yellow VW driver was i hope you get them all including peter shane and other accomplices too so here maury terry who's trudy zeke is basically confirming his own bullshit i mean it's total crap this is not good research this is not integrity this is not dogged uh, investigation skills what this is is cult of personality around a, a guy who wrote a really, really fun book of fiction that people took as true, and they treated him like a rock star, and he loved it. That's that's basically the, the long and short of it. And he had to keep that image going to, to the his last, breath, his last breath. You know why? Because he knew he was lying the whole time. There was no way he could have ever let anyone into that inner circle to 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 read his files and to look at his his methodology and to look at the and to look at anything that he had because it was all shit stained garbage and he knew it. Guaranteed Maury Terry knew that he was he was lying to us the whole time. All right. So moving right along. Number 4, the Brooklyn debacle. So now, again, greatest hits, right? So I could have picked 50, 60, 70 of these things to, to do. I have a million videos going into great detail on all this stuff. I suggest that people do the research themselves. But what I wanted to do here was choose 10 things that are just absolutely airtight, right? Like there's no way that a moron can look at this and and... I mean, they'll still put their heads up their asses and pretend it doesn't exist, but it does exist, right? And 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 there's this, there's just no way out of any of the stuff that I'm showing you. You can't be explained away. It can't be shown to be a, a, a an honest error. None of it. Okay. This is all this is all crap that Maury shit sandwich that Maury Terry tried to make us all eat. Some people are still eating it to this day. I'm not. The Brooklyn debacle. So I listen. I did a, a, a show with J the great John Catalano where we spent almost ten hours on Brooklyn, going through every aspect of that shooting. We're about to start the same process with Freund. We're gonna have at least two, maybe three shows on the Freund shooting. It's the, it's that deep, okay? And we found so many, so many distortions, lies, errors, manipulations, outright making shit up by Maury. It's gonna be even more easy to follow than Brooklyn ever was. Okay. But I would, I would absolutely recommend that you go watch that 10 hours of the Brooklyn series. Uh, we explained the VW hoax, how that was all bullshit, but there's a couple things in, in that I wanted to show you today because it's just so painfully obvious how Maury lied to us about the, about the Moskowitz shooting. So 1 30 AM, Mr. and Mrs. Frank Raymond, walking their dog on the service road near the overpass, notice a similar man by the hole in the fence which separates the parkway green belt from the service road. Seeing the Raymonds looking at him, the man ducks back behind some shrubbery. So, of course, this is the um, lead up to the shooting, the timeline of all the, the, the cast of characters before Stacy and Robert got shot at 2.30. So at 1.30, he says that the Raymonds were walking their dog and saw basically saw one of the shooters duck behind some shrubbery. That's what he's basically saying here. I mean, do you think that I'm reading this wrong? Am I am I mischaracterizing what I'm reading here? Or am I am I am I misexplaining? This is basically saying that they saw the shooter right here and they saw it at 1.30. The only problem is that the Raymondis, the Raymondos who were in the files, Brooklyn, they, they saw this at 1105, 2105. She was walking her dog at 1105. This is almost three hours before, right? Two and a half hours before Maury said that this occurred. So this is a great example of Maury using something, right? She saw somebody coming and turn back into the tree area and walk behind a tree, obstructing the view of witnesses. She didn't see it at 1.30, though. It says here 1.30 in the book. In the actual real bona fide, real police report that exists in the real world that was a police report done on real people in the corporate real world that actually exists that you can hold in your hand, it says here 
11, 2105. That's 1105. No, wait, 2105. That might be earlier than, than 1105, actually. 21. I, I'm terrible with military time, but somebody out there tell me what 2105 is because that's the time this took place, not 1.30 a.m. And then at 2.35, that's 9.05. So four hours before, before the shooting, they saw a guy turn away from them in the shrubbery when they were walking a dog. Guy was probably just taking a piss. It was July. It was it was nine o'clock. It was probably still slightly twilighted out. OK, maybe this guy was taking a piss in the shrubs. He didn't want someone to see his garbage. OK, he didn't want he didn't want Miss Raimondo to see his uh, his John Thomas. OK, but Maury would have us think that that guy was a shooter. So here we have a 235 about 100 yards away. On the opposite side of a park at the 17th Avenue exit, a beautician who is seated in a car with her boyfriend sees a white male with dark eyebrows, possibly wearing a denim jacket and wearing a light-colored, cheap nylon wig, exit the park at a fast pace, enter a small, light-colored auto, and speed away. So this, of course, was the beginning of the of Maury Terry's VW hoax, yellow VW hoax. He had a... ...was the shooter. Can you guys still hear me? Hold on. I had some issue with my, can you hear me? Yeah, I think you guys can still hear me. Um, he would have, a, so this was the beginning of the, of the, um, of the, uh, of the whole VW debacle, right? 235. So, so this is like right after the shooting, according to Maury's timeline. But when you look at the actual police report, on August 6, 1977, the undersigned responded to the 10th homicide zone, anonymous female beautician, States that she was parked with her boyfriend on 17th Court handball at 2.45 when she observed a male white, blue denim jacket, dungarees, dark eyebrows, light color, cheap nylon wig, exit park at fast pace, enter light color, small auto, and speed away. She remarked to her boyfriend that that guy looks like he just robbed a bank. So this happened 15 minutes after the shooting. The, the shooting occurred at 2.31. Okay. So she saw this at 2.45. Maury said that she saw him at 2.35. This is a critical piece of information that he juiced. That 10 minutes, right? If it happened at 2.35, we maybe can believe that the shooting and this guy running away at the opposite side of the park were connected. The guy shoots. It takes him about a minute to run to the opposite side of the park. He's running away. He gets into the, into the car, which, by the way, isn't mentioned as a yellow VW here just a small light colored auto, right? And so and so Maury manipulated us into thinking this because it happened at 245. Well, sorry, this happened 15 minutes after the shooting. This was probably somebody who came to the site, heard that there was a shooting and got the hell out of there or maybe was illicitly doing drugs or maybe there was some homo stuff going on in this park. I don't think so. But um it's very unlikely that this had anything to do with Son of Sam. In fact, impossible. You know why? Because Berkowitz was there. He got the parking ticket. He shot Stacy and Robert. He he ran out of the park through the through the um, handball courts where an eyewitness did actually see him run out of there. She describes him perfectly um, at the exact right correct time as well. Uh, you know, and Maury didn't add that into his into his narrative, but he he added this, and he had to change the time on both of these reports by significant amounts in order to make this in order to make this fit his narrative. So again, these are just two small examples of the way of the way he totally um, manipulated us in the Brooklyn shooting. Um, and also, and you know, another reason why I'm doing this uh, this show today before the. Um, before we start on Freund is because I want this to be fresh into your mind. I want all of this information and what Maury's his pensions, right? Like what book club says here, he takes witness statements and accounts and embellishes them, takes general observations or details and uses them to craft the narrative, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna see this like crazy in Freund. And so what I want to do is I kind of want to prep you guys in the sense that I'm not trying to manipulate you into thinking and then we're going to juice information. No, I'm trying to just get my audience into this mindset of freshly knowing into their mind Maury's M.O., Mo's Mo, the way that he loved to bullshit us because we're going to see it very starkly in, in, um, 
and Freud. And listen, I didn't get into this in order to become Maury's big, biggest critic. I got into this to show you the sights of the ultimate evil. That's all I did. But because I am, am, have self-respect and I'm honest first and foremost with myself, but then, of course, honest with the audience, I couldn't continue this farce once I realized that this Maury Terry was full of shit. And I wouldn't be able to do any of these shows, right? If this information didn't exist out there in the real world that I'm showing you. Okay, because I'm not actually inventing stuff like Maury did. I'm just showing you the files that exist that anybody could go out and do. You all can go out and do out the, do this work yourself. Okay, the problem is nobody does. So I'm going to do it. And 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 that's fine. I enjoy it. I love doing this. And in a way, I feel like this is kind of like my life's calling, the son of Sam case. I don't understand why that is or how I got into this or what pushed me into 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 becoming one of the, you know, one of the biggest names in the son of Sam game since Maury Terry. But um, I wouldn't be able to do this if the if the evidence of his bullshitting wasn't here. So that brings us to guys that brings us to. Oh yeah, please subscribe to the channel. I'm I'm like at 2497, then it goes to six, then it goes up to 2499. Just subscribe so I can get past 2500 for for crying out loud. I mean, I used to be at 18,000 with my old <laughs> with my old YouTube channel. Um, where did all those people go? So anyhow, all right. So now we are at. I wish I had sound effects of a drum roll, because we are now. At number three, two, one, Moe's Toes. And of course, what is a Moe's Toe? Well, of course, this is named after the famous Cecilia Davis and her incredibly huge, monstrous camel toe. I mean, this thing is humongous. I mean, even Helen Keller could do lip reading on this. I mean, this is, this is insane. Um so what I decided to do is I've decided to call Maury's penchant for, for when he needs to invent inf information, like when he just needs to make shit up, he just literally makes shit up. <laughs> All right. So I'm calling those camel toes from now on. So whenever Maury pulls a, a camel toe, that's him just literally making shit up when out of thin air, just pulling stuff out of thin air when he needs to. Okay. So, so. We're going to now, so number three, two, and one are Moe's toes, are his um, three biggest camel toes. I mean, didn't the photographer tell her, yo, um, Mrs. Davis, uh, yeah, not for nothing, but yo, we're, we're not a Pano magazine. We can't like print this. Go into your house, pull that thing out, do something. We'll get on a pair of men's, under like, do something about this thing. It's huge. <sighs> All right. So number three is Cecilia Davis, who we named Moe's Toes after. And of course, this is one of the biggest debacles there is. Maury Terry literally made up one of the hugest aspects of the Brooklyn shooting. And that is the whole thing about um, David Berkowitz driving away and leaving the scene of the crime and following the cops after he wrote the ticket. As the police who are in front of Howard's car, now this is from The Ultimate Evil, start to drive off. Mrs. Davis sees the young man down the block, quickly enter his galaxy and speed up behind her and Howard. Clearly agitated, he blares his horn loudly several times to get by. Mrs. Davis climbs out and walks behind Howard's car and in front of the Ford. As Howard drives off, she stands on the curb, lurking at the profile of the impatient young man in the galaxy as he passes. She notices the denim jacket and the dark, short, cropped hair. So this is in The Ultimate Evil. This is the whole camel toe of Berkowitz leaving the scene, right? Berkowitz leaves the scene, right? Which means that he couldn't have been in the park, which means that he couldn't have done, done the shooting. This, this leaving the scene was absolutely critical to Maury Terry's narrative of Brooklyn. The only problem is it's nowhere to be found in the in the police reports or any of the of the contemporary meaning of that time period, 1977, August, uh, July 29, uh, thir June, July 31st, August 1st. Right. In any of the media reports, there is absolutely zero. Evidence, zero uh, writing, zero notations of Berkowitz driving away. Here's here's um, Cecilia Davis's witness statement. 
He was walking as witness describes as like a cat, very slow and almost like a soldier with one step in front of each other. His face is described as being slick or oily with high cheekbones. His eyes appeared dark and he looked to be almost handsome. He had almost no sideburns and his face was smooth. His no nose was not pointed and not too large. Witness then noticed a portable radio in his right hand held tightly against his right leg. His hand appeared small, but he was able to hide almost the whole thing. As he approached closer, he turned his head away and witness noticed his shirt had a tiny spots on it and his shirt was tucked under his jacket. He appeared well built. However, she further stated he had something abnormal about his stomach. There looked like a swelling or something tucked under his shirt. He turned and walked into the courtyard in the direction of 16th Street. Witness now noticed the portable no longer looked like a radio. Witness stated that it looked like something else, like a gun. Witness. All right. So blah, blah, blah. What? Um, what I'll keep reading this. I, I don't want to bore you guys. She mentions nothing about him driving away. Okay. Zilch. Zero. In this newspaper article, which the great Ruby found and sent me yesterday. Okay. And I have 20 other articles showing the same thing. And we're only going to see one because that's all you need to see. They all show the same thing. It mentions nothing about him driving away. Because a frightened woman overcame her fear and told police about a car parked near a fire hydrant at the, later, at the, at, at the latest murder scene and told of a cop ticketing the car. Okay? Mentions nothing if the woman had shrugged off the memory of the parked car. Okay? Memory of the parked car. She didn't say it was driven away. John Catalano, Manny. Cecilia's statement to Brooklyn prosecutor never mentioned Berkowitz driving away following the police car. Exactly, John. And the reason why is because Maury camel towed it. He literally made it up because he had to make it up. He had to get Berkowitz away from that scene in order for his cult bullshit in order to make sense. Berkowitz never drove away from the scene. And one of the things that the morons never asked themselves is if he drove away, okay, great. Where did he, where did he park? <laughs> right because when the eyewitness saw him driving uh, running away from the scene of the crime right afterwards describing him in perfect detail walking out of the 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 fence and the hole in the fence exactly how he described running away she saw him running through the courtyard exactly where his car was parked where he got the ticket so so why would if he moved the car, if he drove away, did he, he reparked in the same spot? I mean, it just makes no, none of it makes any sense. Now book club warrior is, um, is, uh, is giving a spoiler alert here. Uh, he should have given a spoiler alert, but I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say it. That's what vindication is about this weekend. Um, the current, current killer tape podcast in his own words, he speaks about the ticket. So on, on our, our next vindication, um, Listen, uh, well, I'm just going to we're just going to talk about it when we get into it on Saturday, but that'll be what vindication is about, about this, this, this subject. All right, cool. So, of course, the only place where we ever see anything about some some driving away is in Maury's reporting. OK. So only Maury Terry's reporting contained the story. So here's an article. It says here the second sighting of Berkowitz by Cecilia Davis. Right. Uh um, Berkowitz returned to the area too late to have been the gunman. Um, Berkowitz drove away. Uh, let's see. Ba, 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 ba. Right. So he returned to the area. So this is him whole re the whole returning to the area after he drove away. Okay. So the only place where we ever see this is in Maury Terry's reporting. Okay, which means that he made it up, plain and simple. Paul Hart, Cecilia herself wrote a detailed full page article for the Daily News about what she saw that night. Nothing about Berkowitz driving away. Yes. And one of the things that's instructive about realizing all of this about the contemporary news reports, the news reports from 1977, from the days after the crimes, those are going to be when people have the best remembrances, when they remember the most, when it's fresh into their head. If this woman saw Berkowitz driving away, like three years later, she saw, she told Maury Terry, right, in 79, two years later, she tells Maury Terry, allegedly tells Maury Terry 
that he drove away. Where was this in 77? How come it never came out? Moet, I'll, I'll sing on, uh, on Saturday. Okay. I won't forget you. I won't forget you. Um, all right, cool. All right. So number two, our second, our second camel toe, Tommy Zeno. So now I have a whole video. I have videos on many of these, a larger videos on many of these topics. If you're interested, in, if you're interested, this is kind of like a survey, a best of a greatest hits, if you will. But Tommy Zeno is one of the stark ex examples of a camel toe um, because, um, well, Tommy Zeno was quite frankly, not only was he NYPD's best witness to Son of Sam, but he was also Maury Terry's um, uh, uh, best witness. Maury Terry sque squeezed Tommy Zeno to within an inch of his life getting trying to get information out of him, and he got information out of him. But the issue is, was it true or not? So Eugene Reed asks, did the detectives investigating inquire about this driving away? No, because she never mentioned it. She never mentioned it in any of her police reports or contemporary news articles. So Tommy Zeno is an unreliable narrator. He can't be believed. Okay. So if, if in, a, in, a, in, in a Maury production, right, when Maury Terry gets to him, here are his quotes. I'm not playing this because I don't want to get this video struck. I, 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 I know about fair use. I, people are teaching me about fair use. I, I'm going to get into fair use and all that kind of stuff, but I didn't want to take the chance on today's video. So these are his quotes from that, from that, from that. Uh, it was Unsolved Mysteries, Son of Sam episode 1988. He says the following. I can't picture Berkowitz running like that. That's the thing that confused me after they caught him. In a week, he can't get that fat. Uh, that's all I can say. He, he didn't look like the type of guy that could run and do that. I didn't think it was Berkowitz then, and I don't think it's him now. I definitely don't think it's him. All right, so that's pretty unequivocal. He, he didn't think it was him. He, 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 it was never Berkowitz, according to Tommy Zeno. Um, Tommy Zeno never saw Berkowitz ever at all. Um, the only issue is, uh, well, listen, let's listen to Tommy Zeno's tape to the uh, Queen's DA, and this is just a very short excerpt. But at this point, having seen photographs of Berkowitz, um, both on TV and in the press, you, do you feel it's the same person that, that pulled the trigger that yeah. night? Yeah. Even though the discrepancy in the hair is as great as it is. Yeah. You, so, yeah, I still say it's him. Now you mentioned something earlier about uh, still say it's him. wet hair would look that way. Was that something you... Thought of what the, the police happened to mention. No, they didn't tell me nothing. You know. Has anyone swayed your opinion as far as what you saw, or what you could have seen that night? By the way, I bet you they're talking about Maury Terry here. Has anyone swayed your opinion? I think that Queen's DA was on to Maury Terry, and that's another thing that we need to deal with. In the book, Maury Terry acts as if Queen's DA was his biggest supporters. The that's that's the furthest from the truth. Those guys thought he was a crackpot. It's obvious. So listen to them here trying to. So first of all, Tommy Zeno said he thought it was Berkowitz and it was definitely him. And here they are asking if he's been swayed by anybody. OK, I, what do you mean? In other words, have you been biased by, uh, say, the police department mentioning that it, it could have looked that way if his hair was wet or anyone else he may have spoken to since then that may have injected some other thoughts? Yeah, no. Nah, nobody really. Everybody, when they seen this picture, you know, they ain't really. They, I don't know. I don't know if they really believe me that what I seen with the hair was the right way. But if you just, if you saw him in the lineup with others, you think you can pick him up? Of course, you saw his pictures, true picture. I seen his pictures. It's, that's why. Are you say, but, are, uh, are you satisfied that that was David Buckwoods? You know, when I seen him. In other words, what I'm getting at first seeing him, something that night I I remember the first night when they, you know, it was uh, when they caught him. It was uh, you know, I was I was still in the hotel and everything, and I seen it on TV. It was flashed on me, you know, he was downtown, and I seen him. And something went through me, and I looked at him, and I, you know, I knew it was him. So it's. Pretty cut and dry. He knew it was him. <laughs> he, 
he 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 had no problem telling an actual real bona fide law enforcement association uh, with actual real police powers, subpoena powers. I, I would assume arrest powers. Um, I would assume they put him under oath that he was speaking uh, uh, under oath, uh, swearing to, to tell the truth. Um, yeah. He basically said he saw Berkowitz and Kaiser. Yeah, he changed his story for the benefit of the Unsolved Mystery episode. So I'm not going to um, ascribe motivations to Tommy Zeno. I, I, I've told I haven't gotten too deep into the story of me and Zeno and our our the beginning of our we, we were going to do work together. We had spoken to each other. He actually was a, f a fan of the series. He liked my work. He wanted to write a book and he wanted to do a documentary and we were going to do all this stuff together. And uh, then Neo came in and swooped him away and 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 shuffled, shoved him off to Carl Denaro, which was a punk move. And that caused the entire meltdown of my original video series and my original research team. Um, so so, you know, I, I just I don't want to ascribe any bad motivations to Tommy. I'm just going to say that he's unreliable and that he's told three at least three different stories i believe the one that he told the queen's da okay if you don't want to believe that hey you you can go watch the lumped up guys talking about maria cortina all right and how she was uh, had a had a pendant around her uh a necklace pendant that suzanne conway gave her so somehow or other that means something i mean it's absolute trek you, you always have those stations to listen to and finally, guys, our number one, although it's not really number one in terms of importance, but, you know, Tommy Zeno could have been number one, but it just happened to be number one. Our number our number one camel toe and number one on today's list is, of course, Florence Larson, which we just dealt with me and Catalano just dealt with in the dead dogs. And, and I can't speak for Catalano, but I'm going to go on record and say this is a, another one of Maury's major camel toes. All right. And this, of course, deals with the woman who said that um, who said that Berkowitz had called her inquiring about a German shepherd and that he went up there and they investigated it and they found they ended up finding nothing. But she says that he called her to inquire about a about a German shepherd and that he went and visited it. Right. Miss Larson says she supplied Berkowitz's name and address on a piece of paper and then forgot about him until she heard of his arrest. Very clear cut. Right. She put his name on a piece of paper and then forgot about him until she heard of his arrest. Okay. So a very milquetoast story, not nothing huge or major. But the problem is that when Maury gets to it, all of a sudden, Florence Larson, this is so this was written, this article, th this first one was written in 77. Again, contemporary with the crime, right after the arrest, when memories were fresh, when people were telling what they just experienced. Two years later, in 79, in an article by Maury Terry, all of a sudden, there's an additional part of the story. She says, Berkowitz, um, or someone using his name, was one of two callers who inquired about a German shepherd advertised. So now we get two callers. It was one in the original article. It was just David Berkowitz. But now we get two callers. OK. Oh, and it just is a coincidence. Berkowitz and the other caller both mentioned Pine Street in Yonkers, where Berkowitz lived. The other caller said he fixed cars or cars behind Pine Street in Yonkers, according to Florence Larson. Well, why would she say that when two years later to Maury Terry, when she didn't say that to the original in any of the original articles about this? So book club is correct. He, his articles were used to set up the public for his book. He, he was putting out these trial balloon bullshit, art, bullshit camel toes, right, in his, in his articles and seeing if the shit would stick. And, and the shit did stick. So he felt empowered and he kept on with his bull crap and it ended up with the ultimate evil, an entire book filled with lies. Um, so... So here's an, a good question. You may have addressed this and I missed it. What do you believe Terry's agenda was with all these untruths? I don't know. That's for somebody who actually knew him uh, personally to to uh, to say more than me. I can't I was not in the guy's head, so I don't know what his personal agenda was. The only thing I can do, Shug Beat, is is um, 
tell you the truth as I see it, which is dealing with the actual evidence, his words versus the police reports and the actual documented factual evidence. And when you do that, you realize that there's a huge discrepancy dis slash disparity. But as far as what his motivations were, I have no clue um, because I don't even think we have the full story yet, to be honest with you. We do not know the full extent of Maury's relationship with the Carr family. A, 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 allegedly, there was one, right? We heard the story a couple times now from Weed about how Maury got kicked out of their house when he was a teenager for acting lewdly to somebody. In one story, it was John Carr's girlfriend. In another story, it was to Wheat. So who knows the veracity of that story? But we certainly don't have um, a lot of information, should be that we would need in order to answer that question with any real, with real integrity and honesty. So I see people are um, answering that question for you in the chat and God bless them all. I'm not going to say that they're wrong. I'm not going to say that they're right. All I'm going to say is that for my part, um, I, I can say Maury was absolutely a liar, a manipulator, a bullier, an abuser. But why he was those things, I have no clue. So anyway, guys, that is our um, slideshow for the day. We got in and, in and out in a little uh, over an hour and a half, which is great. Um, this was a good setup show for our Freund, uh, uh, series, which is, uh, which we're going to be scheduling fairly soon. I, I think we should probably be doing our Freund series within the next two or three weeks for sure. That's going to be a blockbuster. That's going to be a very, very deep, in-depth Brooklyn type series where we study police reports, we study the crime, we study the timeline, we, we, we compare it with what Maury Terry wrote, and we get extremely deep about the Freud case. So um, anyway, uh, I don't think anything else needs to be said. You guys were great in the chat. Um, everyone seemed to be having a good time, which is what I like. And... Uh, that's basically it. You guys are talking amongst yourselves about the case, which is really all we could we, we can ask for. So anyway, guys, I don't have much more else to say other than it's painfully obvious that we were played for suckers by this drunkard, user, manipulator, not good friend, liar, bullier, abuser, guy who would throw down nine-year-olds on the floor, skinning their knees, a guy who would tell a victim that it was, wasn't Berkowitz who shot you, that he wouldn't... I mean, it, I can go on and on, right? The The simple fact is this guy shat on truth. He shat on the Son of Sam case. And because of that, Maury Terry is actually a true crime criminal. He's a criminal of truth. I'm trying to think of, a, of, a, of, a, of another witticism, but I can't. So anyway, all right, guys. I think I'm, I think, <laughs> I think I'm a little burnt out. So check out... Um, Vindication on Saturday morning. We're going to be dealing with uh, Berkowitz's uh, description and depiction of the Brooklyn shooting. And uh, well, he left a certain passage out if Maury's narrative is true, that is. Anyway, guys, I want to say thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Wouldn't be doing this without you. Couldn't be doing this without you. You make it all worthwhile. Super, super appreciative. Thank you so much. And we will see you on the next show. Take care, guys.